Um, I wish to introduce uh, Dr. Vogel, who's uh, kindly agreed to talk to us about uh, Fraunhofer FEP. Uh, that is one of the many Fraunhofer Institutes, in this case, concerned with uh, organic electronics and electron beam and plasma deposition. And the obvious question to start with, Dr. Fogel, is uh, what is uh, all that? How does it fit together? <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks for the good question. And indeed, uh, considering the history of Fraunhofer FEP, uh, originally it was founded in 1992 or so, um, and uh, long before my time. And um, at that point in time, it was mainly dedicated uh, to electron beam uh, and plasma technology. So mainly methods uh, for, well, for creating or for generating electron beams and for performing a specific, uh, let's say, material, um, um, to say material um, adaptation yes. uh, uh, steps, uh, but also let's say for using electron beam, let's say for different uh, kinds of applications, as uh, for instance also let's say sterilization, uh, also for uh, let's say for electron beam based evaporation uh, and uh, several approaches. Um, and plasma technology has mainly been used uh, for uh, deposition uh, of uh, several materials, uh, thin films, uh, for instance, also uh, barrier films, uh, but also, let's say, optically um, um, active uh, films, or let's say, for optical filters or similar. Um, and uh, let's say, these uh, two uh, general uh, topics uh, have been the original reason for founding this institute in uh -huh. the early 90s. Uh, the organic electronics actually, um, well, joined uh, Fraunhofer FEP in uh, 2014. And uh, since it was, um, until that point in time, it was uh, part of, um, of another Fraunhofer uh, entity, uh, which has been joined with FEP in 2014. And that's why, uh, let's say, now it's organic electronics, electron beam and plasma technology. But anyway, one of the reasons to join, uh, let's say, these uh, or well, let's say this organic electronics uh, Fraunhofer entity uh, together with uh, the original Fraunhofer FFP was that there have been, uh, let's say, several synergies already uh, before that. Uh, so we already had some collaboration uh, with Fraunhofer FFP, for instance, also on their uh, expertise in, let's say, in, in, in specific tools and specific equipments. So, uh, you know, for instance, uh, also, let's say, in OLED, but also, let's say, in Zinfilm uh, deposition in general, there are sheet-to-sheet -sheet, uh, equipment, um, as well as uh, rotor roll equipments, uh, and uh, Fraunhofer FEP, already the original one, has been active in uh, developing uh, roll to roll tools, for instance, for barrier uh, film depositions. Uh, and at uh, the previous uh, front of a comet, which worked in the uh, organic electronics, um, we already operated a uh, tool for OLED uh, to wall deposition, which was already uh, before 2014 uh, located at the front of FEP, but operated by front of a comet at that point in time. Uh, and uh, also, let's say, front of FEP originally has been rather, let's say, process development oriented, whereas uh, the previous uh, form of a comet uh, has a little bit more focus, I mean, which was focusing on organic electronics, but more focusing on using processes, also developing processes, but also using processes uh, for specific applications. So, for instance, for displays, for micro displays, uh, or also for uh, OLED and lighting and signage applications. So, and that uh, made also, let's say, a good uh, fit uh, for Fraunhofer to even, uh, let's say, uh, make use or make advantage of the synergies between the process uh, oriented uh, original FEP and the more, let's say, application and product oriented or device oriented uh, form of a comet. And so that synergy turned out to be successful. Mm. Well, that's interesting. And organic electronics, sometimes that includes the inorganic materials and composites on an organic substrate. Or are you specializing? specifically in organic active materials? Well, in the uh, 
in the FEP in general, uh, we are working on several types of substrates. So, I mean, uh, of course, we make use of organic substrates. Um, for instance, also uh, barrier films uh, are being deposited uh, on organic substrates, for instance, by road to road process processing, and uh, those foils uh, are being used for packaging, for instance, uh, packaging applications or, or other applications. Um, we are also making use of glass substrates, obviously, both um, rigid as well as ultra thin glass mm. uh, that can be uh, flexible. Or, um, and also, let's say, uh, ultra thin glass, for instance, can be used for both, uh, as a, both as a substrate as well as an uh, encapsulation, uh, mm. let's say, material again, so to provide uh, barrier properties, for instance. So, uh, and last but not least, um, if we consider micro displays, we are using silicon wafers, single crystalline silicon wafers as a substrate, uh, where we deposit uh, the OLED uh, on top, on 8 inch wafer level, for instance. Um, and, uh, so, and also, let's say, the OLED becomes uh, covered uh, with a thin film encapsulation layer, layer again, with a barrier layer, uh, and also, last but not least, with a hard coat or with another. Um, color filter, glass wafer, or similar. So we work with several types of substrates uh, and uh, often we heterogeneously combine uh, several materials, inorganic, organic, with each other. And, uh, yes, and what you put on them is also organic and inorganic, yes, like yes, the barrier yes. layers. Do you do the duplex ones with the organic and inorganic layers? Yes, yes that's one All thing, right. or the organic semiconductors themselves, uh, mm. which are well, organic, um, uh, but for instance also for uh, optical filter uh, layers, uh, these might be inorganic ah. materials again, so, All right. and, and often these are also, let's say, combinations of both. All right, and your speciality is micro displays, can you tell us a little more? Yes, yeah, sure, of course. So, uh, micro displays are, well, usually very tiny displays, typically screen diagonals less than one inch, but even more typical, these are, let's say, 0.2 inch, 0.4 inch, 0.6 inch, mm -hmm. so rather tiny displays, and you always need some sort of optical magnification uh, to perceive an, an image out of those tiny displays, since you have to uh, imagine that on such a tiny screen you still have the same number of pixels as you have on a regular well, nowadays yes. uh, mobile phone display TV screen or whatever so very tiny and you would not be able to let's say uh, to perceive an image uh, with your naked eye from such a tiny screen so you always would need some optical magnification uh, in front of that and uh, that optical magnification could mean let's say um, uh, virtually uh, or let's say an, let's say a virtually enlarged image so you have some sort of magnification optics uh, that project projects uh, the, the a display image into it's say uh, your your natural field of view. Mm. This can be augmented reality, or this could be virtual reality, or maybe also an electronic viewfinder where you have the same, uh, mm. let's say, projection setup. Or it can also be, let's say, um, a real, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, enlarged magnification, so like in a projector, for instance, or in a front projector. Mm. So, uh, but in any case, uh, let's say, some optical magnification uh, is. Uh, part of that uh, and uh, so always you have a tiny display and a much larger image perceived mm. and uh, we also make use of OLED so organic semiconductors again uh, for making those uh, micro displays OLED micro displays obviously in that case and the technology for that is called OLED and silicon so we use a uh, single crystalline silicon wafer substrate uh, we perform the so-called backplane design, so if you think of a, such a micro display with millions of pixels, full HD resolution for instance, so each of the millions of pixels has to be uh, addressed and uh, driven and controlled individually, mm -hmm. so you need a backplane for that, an active matrix backplane, similar as you have it in a, in a mobile phone, but whereas uh, in a, in a mobile phone, you have a thin film transistor backplane, and mm. micro displays we usually use a mm. single crystalline silicon backplane. So much more compact devices, much higher performance, but a much smaller area. 
and we uh, make this IZ integrate circuitry backplane design, so the pixel uh, array circuitry and let's say all the surrounding driving and control electronics. And then uh, we receive the wafers from a wafer fab, so we send our design data to them, we receive the 8 inch wafers from uh, that fab, and then we perform the OLED post processing in our line, in our pilot manufacturing line. And then we come up with uh, such tiny displays. Maybe I can even oh, yes, show please. you something. Yes. yes. Because I OLED know. have been a huge success and a long way to go, haven't they? Then. Is that uh, something that can be seen here? Yeah, I don't know. It should be. It should light up inside. Mm. Can you see tiny. that? There should be some. Tiny. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, that's the idea. Absolutely. And yes, uh, yes. I can even show you the display itself. Yes. I mean, most of that is just battery electronics and and the tube. Yes. And the tube over here is mainly hollow. Uh, and there's a, a lens in front of that, and the actual display is here on the end of this tube. So you can yes, imagine that's yes. the interface towards the display. Yes. So it's a serial interface, so just a few uh, cables inside, and the display is here behind uh, that tape. And so the display itself is, uh, I don't know, about 3 by 4 millimeters, or well, let's say the entire chip is about 3 by 4 millimeters inside. Yes. Yes. So, um, and the display area may be about 3 by 2 millimeters. And that's it, so rather what, tiny. What sort of applications are now envisaged? Yes, I mean, uh, specifically that sort of display is um, intended to be um, integrated into, let's say, near-to-eye displays. Yeah. So uh, let's assume you have kind of sports glasses, yeah. and you have such a tiny display. I mean, the optics is, as you can imagine, the, the biggest part of the entire thing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there are also uh, different uh, optical solutions uh, you can think of. Yes. And then you can really uh, integrate that, or at least the display and the interface for that, let's say into the nose frame mm. uh, of a, yes. uh, let's say, uh, of, a, of spectacles. Um, and uh, then you might uh, also consider, let's say, a different type of optics uh, that is more or less, let's say, also projecting uh, the display image uh, onto yes. the, the yes. let's say, yes. your, your eyeglass. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then you would also embed some maybe smaller batteries in here and also let's say uh, electronics the same as here maybe but also in a smaller form factor that provides a bluetooth low energy connection to your mobile phone for instance yeah. and then you can uh, wear that uh, let's say during cycling for instance during bicycling yeah. uh, or, or let's say also during professional activities mm. uh, and you receive uh, perceive additional information yeah. uh, let's say, in a, in a semantic context to the yeah. activities that you are currently performing. Yeah. And let's say, and, and the, the eyewear device itself is a rather thumb device, it's just a display, the optics mm. of course, and let's say a wireless interface. Mm. Uh, and then let's say all the say, processing power and cloud connection and whatever mm. you might need uh, could be performed by your smartphone, for instance. Right. So that, and yes. that is and and what is uh, specifically important, uh, let's say specifically in those variable applications, is obviously life, the battery life. Mm. So I mean, you would not like to to recharge your device every four mm. hours or whatever. Mm. So let's say also let's say during cycling, it should last at least one day, and mm. it depend if it's twelve hours or or eight hours or whatever. Uh, and that's why we, let's say, also this specific micro display uh, architecture uh, has been developed to really, let's say, achieve ultra low power consumption. Mm. So, I mean, finally, the consumption of uh, the power consumption of that chip is just related to the to those pixels that are on at a certain uh, mm. point in time. So, and all the other pixels are off, and, ah, and, and but there's right. a major difference to, let's say, to mm. regular uh, OLED displays on the market is that even the chip itself does not uh, consume uh, much mm. power. On a regular, let's say, micro display nowadays, uh, the chip would consume power even if the display content would not change. Mm. So, and uh, to give you, let's say, a, a, a proportion, let's say the, 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 the backplane, the chip itself would consume about 100, 150 milliwatt, milliwatt but there would be no change in the, in the screen content. Yeah. So even, let's say, if the screen would be completely dark, all pixels off, it would consume this 100, 150 milliwatts, so actually mm. for nothing. So, mm. and then, of course, the, the actual OLED, the power consumption for the OLED emission comes on top, mm. whatever, 10 milliwatt, mm. 50 milliwatt, something like that. And for that architecture, 
even if you display uh, a certain screen content, uh, the chip itself is not really consuming power. It's much less than one milliwatt mm. that goes into the chip. So it's mm. more, almost about a factor of 100 between a regular display backplane architecture and this one. So as long as there's no change in the screen uh, content, uh, you just consume uh, the power of the OLED pixels that are on that are mm. emitting light. Mm. So and um, and the chip itself is more or less consuming nothing anymore, mm. and that really improves the battery life of such a variable. Yes, and, yes, and significantly, so, yes. not just a few hours. Yes. So now you yeah. can talk about days, weeks. Yes, yes. So there were companies that were unsuccessful in this field um, many years ago, weren't there? So these advances should uh, make the product a commercial success. That's very exciting. Well, you have a remarkable virtuosity in your institute, so thank you very much. We shall stay very close to you. You're extremely impressive in what you're doing, and uh, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you as well for say, this kind interview. You're welcome. <laughs>